What is happening, spooky people? And welcome back to another episode of Oddity Acres. Today, we are headed to a little town about 20 miles outside of Cleveland, Ohio, called Kirtland, Ohio. Now, Kirtland is absolutely beautiful this time of year, especially in the fall. It holds one of the United States' largest arboretums and botanical gardens as well. Now, just like a lot of other small towns in the United States, this is absolutely a picturesque place to be. But it does have its dark history. On April 17th, 1989, religious cult leader Jeffrey Lundgren and his followers killed a family of five and left him in shallow graves inside of a barn. Join us as we explore the story, look into the events, and travel to locations where these horrible acts took place. This is Out of the Acres. So Jeffrey Lundgren, he was born in 1950 in Independence, Missouri, um, and he was born to two very, very religious parents. So as he grew older, he kind of realized that he was good at one particular thing, and that was memorizing word for word uh, scriptures and things out of the Bible, and more importantly, the Book of Mormon. So this eventually led him to the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and it was only ironic that Independence, Missouri was actually the world headquarters for this religion. So they do believe in modern day prophets coming to this earth, as well as the return of Jesus Christ uh, to specifically Independence, Missouri. Now, during college, Lundgren met a girl named Alice, and he was able to convince her that he was going to be the next prophet. So after failing out of college in a short stint in Vietnam, Lundgren went to Alice and he said, I'm having these visions. I've seen the crucifixion and God has come to me. He's telling me we need to move to Kirtland, Ohio. That's where we are right now. And that's where it all starts. So one of the main reasons why Jeffrey Lennon wanted to move to Kirtland is because of this temple right behind me. Formerly the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, this was the first temple built by adherents to the Latter-day Saint movement. So in 1984, Jeffrey Lundgren moved to Kirtland, Ohio and became a tour guide of the temple as well as the treasurer of the visitor center. So while Lundgren was working at the church in the visitor center, he lived in a small church owned home. Um, they said within a block or what it said on the internet was a block away from where the church is, um, still on church property. So I'm not sure that the, the temple is actually here and the new, I don't know if this is the same visitor center as it was, but this is the visitor center now. Um, so it would have to be either somewhere behind me in this area or maybe just right across the street here. But um, unfortunately the records online did not show exactly where that location was. Now, only after a few short years of working for the church, Jeffrey was fired due to accusations of theft. From what the records show, he was stealing money that was being contributed by guests. Not only that, but he was taking money from the bookstore and all sorts of different funds. And it came out to be almost twenty-five to $40,000. So 
So in 1987, Jeffrey Lundgren moved to a small house down the road, bringing quite a following with him. At this point, this is where the cult really got its fuel and really got to the point where it started to move forward in the actions that were about to come. So the church and the visitor center is still closed due to COVID or else I would have brought you inside. Um, but uh, we're kind of working with what we got right now. But this is actually a beautiful place to come take a stroll, check out the beautiful fall leaves. Um, as I said, especially this time of year, Kirtland is so beautiful. Um, you know, unfortunately, the story that we're doing is not as beautiful as the city represents. But, um, you know, this is just a small part of Kirtland here. Um, you know, I'm going to get you as close as we can to everything and go from there. So in about two years time after being fired from the church, Jeffrey Lundgren was still living out in the house down the road and he had quite a following, uh, 12 people in fact. Um, and many of them were actually living with him and his wife Alice in that home. They would do rituals, they would do ceremonies, they would read from the scripture um, and he would lead this cult from his home. So around this time, because of the disagreement with the church, he started preaching to his cult that there needed to be a cleansing of the vineyard, that's what he called it. Um, and plans went into place uh, to basically raid this church to, to, to murder and kill. Um, and this led to a lot of investigation between the Kirtland police, even the FBI. In fact, there were actually complaints um, from the neighborhood people saying that they saw on his property people um, in military gear, um, practicing maneuvers, practicing drills, um, you know, with weaponry. Um, so this led the police out to open quite an investigation. So in 1988, the Kirtland police actually met with Jeffrey Lundgren to discuss these issues and these allegations. And um, what it did was it actually made him call the whole entire thing off. It, it scared him to the point where he... Um, thought that they were on to him this whole plan is now foiled it's ruined and they couldn't move forward with it unfortunately because of that it led directly to the murders of the avery family at the farmhouse in april 1988 kirtland's chief of police summoned lundgren to his office for a chat chief yarber called in jeff lundgren and told jeff that we had complaints about people and military gear on jeff's property practicing military maneuvers Lundgren denied his group was doing anything wrong and left. The police could not know it, but this meeting helped set Lundgren's cult on his final bloody course. So among some of Jeffrey Lundgren's followers were tragically and ironically the Avery family. Now the Avery family were kind of on the bottom of the totem pole for the cult um, for quite a few reasons. You know, they're, they they didn't give in to all of the cult's wants and beliefs. Um, you know, they were more of just looking for kind of a place to fit in um, and not necessarily in for the ride, um, so to speak. This made Jeffrey Lundgren very, very angry. Um, you know, this, this was, it, it marked them for, unfortunately, the, the disaster that would come. On April 17th, 1979, Jeffrey Lundgren and his followers lured the Avery family over to their farmhouse and one by one brought them out to the barn and killed them. Gunshots to the back of the head execution style. Finally, after months of nervous anticipation, Jeffrey Lundgren announced that the moment had come to cleanse sin from the group. April 17th, 1989. Lundgren had whipped his followers into such a religious frenzy 
that they were willing to take whatever steps were necessary to ensure what they believed was the return of Jesus Christ. Now, the farmhouse and the barn where this took place in um, is actually a location now of a new church um, built in the place of this where this tragedy happened um, to inspire new growth. And then I think it's a beautiful thing. Um, so we are going right now to the location of the old farmhouse and the barn and the new location of a church called New Promise Church. So I'm standing here on the grounds of New Promise Church, um, and this is where the unfortunate tragic event took place. Um, right now, it's a parking lot, but not that long ago, it was a crime scene, um, and it was the last place where the Avery family were alive. Um, it's always crazy to stand in, in places that, that tragedies happen. Um, you know, it's it's it doesn't become real until you get here, and then you start thinking about things. And the ground that you're standing on, how how something so horrible could happen, um, it, it just really puts you in the moment. So here's where the story gets really crazy. The day after the murders, the FBI, the ATF, and the police show up at this location at Jeffrey Lundgren's house. Now they're believing this is because of the murders and they think they've been found out. However, this was actually following up on the um, incident with the church. Now, this caused sheer panic throughout the, the cult and they decided that they were going to take off. And by that night, this whole farmhouse was empty. The next morning at about 10 o'clock, a group was in for a rude awakening. There was a knock on the door, and it was the Kirtland Police Department and FBI agents. Kirtland Police had involved the FBI in the case of the Lundgren cult eight months earlier. But until now, there was little either law enforcement agency could do. In the 1970s, Guidelines were put in place that forbid the government, and the FBI in particular, from spying on religious and political groups. So when the authorities decided to visit the farm, it was to follow up on information that was long out of date. I got angry at these guys. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, he killed five people last night, and you're asking me about a temple takeover? I just was like... They're not asking the right questions. They're not asking the right questions. Though Alice knew what the right questions were, neither she nor anyone else in the cult told the authorities what had happened the night before. After two hours at the farm, the FBI and police went away frustrated. We knew something was going on. We couldn't penetrate the control Jeff had over the cult members. When we got back to the station, I checked the list. I noticed nobody had interviewed the Averys. I asked one of the agents from the FBI who interviewed him, and he told me nobody did. We didn't think they were important enough. It was an unfortunate miscalculation. By nightfall, Lundgren and his followers had disappeared. Nine months later, on December 31st, 1989, one of the former cult members, Keith Johnson, showed up at the police department and actually spoke about the murders and what happened. Four days later, the Avery family's bodies were exhumed from the barn on this property. This is what started the entire manhunt for the cult members and Jeffrey Lundgren. There is some confusion over the exact number of bodies that have been found in a common grave in the basement of this barn along Route 6. Police, firemen, and federal alcohol, tobacco, and firearms agents spent the entire day sifting through the grave. The body of a man was found last night, two or three others this afternoon. And the search goes on at this hour. You know, I never get used to this. Um, it, it just, it, it always blows my mind to stand at a location where such a horrific thing happened. You know, this, this wasn't that long ago. I mean, this was 1989. You know, this, this is relatively new. This ground, the soil has just been broken here. I mean, this is, you know, this is not something that happened a million years ago. It's a sad thing, but I think that all history is, is worth remembering. Um, you know, not only just 
to remember the family, but also hopefully that, you know, when you remember history, it won't be repeated. With with that being said, hopefully this never happens again in, in this town or any town. So after tracking down the cult followers, many would give full confessions to their role in the murder of the Avery family. Now, since they were so desensitized to violence, it was noted that many of their confessions were just lacking empathy and any sort of sympathy whatsoever. It was like they were emotionless, blank stares, um, you know, that were, were reading a story as opposed to telling the events of this tragic uh, event. Now, the FBI and the ATF would eventually catch up with Jeffrey Lundgren on January 7th, 1990 in a motel between San Diego and the Mexican border. With him, they found a large arsenal of weapons um, and plans, obviously, to hop the border and continue through Mexico. At this point, he was arrested and brought back to Ohio. Trial started in Painesville, Ohio in August of 1990. So we are in Painesville, Ohio right now, and this is where the trials took place. At the end of the trial, 10 people involved with a cult would be indicted on murder charges having to do with the Avery family. So at the end of the trial, Jeffrey, his wife, and his son would all be sentenced with life sentences. So after exhausting all legal appeals, on October 24th, 2006, Jeffrey was sentenced to death and killed by lethal injection. Now this is the place where the actual trials took place. This is the Painesville Municipal Court. Um, and I'm kind of walking the little town center area right now. Fortunately, it's an acting court. We can't get inside. This business is going on, this trial is going on. Um, but I wanted to kind of show you the location where everything came to an end because we started from the beginning in Missouri, we came through Kirtland, and now we are here where the entire story took place and where it finished up. The capital murder trial of cult leader Jeffrey Lundgren began at the courthouse in Painesville, Ohio in August 1990. His court-appointed attorneys knew they had no chance to acquit their client. They considered an insanity defense, but their own psychologists said Lundgren was legally sane. So the trial proceeded, and a parade of state witnesses testified. The defense rarely objected or cross-examined withholding their arguments for sentencing when they would try to save Lundgren's life. For his part, Lundgren showed little interest in his own trial. I wish I could be pleasant about it, but I am demanding that you do the job and that you tell Jeffrey Don Lundgren, this fellow right here, that he's guilty. He's guilty of murdering a man, his wife, and three children. And he should suffer the consequences. As expected, Jeffrey Lundgren was convicted on five counts, each of murder and kidnapping. While Lundgren took full responsibility for the murders of the Avery family, he did not apologize. Instead, for five hours, he preached. I am a prophet of God. I'm even more than a prophet. I am not a false prophet, therefore I am not worthy of the penalty sought by those who seek my death. And it is understandable to me that the legal system has problems with me, a prophet. The scriptures teach one is to abhor sin. I did not abhor Mr. Avery as a person, but I abhorred the sin that was in Mr. Avery as I judged it from the record. He was an individual and family that rejected the truth. I cannot say that I'm sorry I did what God commanded me to do in the physical act. I had great sorrow for them before. I have great sorrow for them now. And that just about does it for another episode of Oddity Acres. Thank you guys for joining me. Um, you know, as I said before, and I say it a lot, all history is worth remembering, whether it be good or bad. You know, and this story, unfortunately, you know, it occurred in such a small town and, and this kind of thing kind of gets swept under the rug and forgotten about. So, you know, I wanted to kind of bring it to light and explain what happened uh, for people that are curious. Um, you know, even when, when Jeffrey Leonard was put to death, his body was never cleaned. I mean, this has been done with, it's over with, it's washed down. And, um, you know, other than some records and some documents in an A&E documentary, it, it doesn't exist anymore. Again, thank you guys so much for liking and subscribing. Uh, stay tuned. We have some great videos coming up. Um, and I'm excited to see you on the next journey. Stay scared.